Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you familiar with the phrase, to make a long story short? Have you ever heard it? Have you ever used it? Have you ever found it to be true? When somebody says that, I settle in. Because I know this story is going to be nothing relating or even close to short. Well, the good news is the last couple of Sundays, Pastor Bruce preached short sermons, and he has yielded a lot of preaching time to me. So this morning, we don't need to worry about me keeping this sermon short. Thank you, Pastor Bruce. I think we all thank him, right? Well, in an effort to make the story of Cornelius and Peter short, the lectionary committee left off a few significant or made left a few significant gaps in the in the story. And now we are jumping into the book of Acts really with with no context. So if you'll indulge me and you don't have much of a choice, um, I will provide some context for where we come across this story in the 10th chapter of Acts. Now Acts is the book that Luke writes as the, the uh, companion or sequel to his gospel. And the book of Acts tells the story of the early Christian church. It tells about the beginning of the church and the days after Jesus' resurrection. After 40 days of post-resurrection appearances, Jesus told the disciples to go to Jerusalem and to wait for what the Father had promised. And after 10 days of waiting, those who were gathered in that upper room heard a sound like a mighty wind coming through the, the room and on each of their heads a tongue as a fire upon their heads. And as they spoke in their own language, they were heard by others in the language that they understood. And through this gift of the Holy Spirit, the Christian church was born at Pentecost. Immediately after the Pentecost event, evangelism began in Acts chapter 3 to 8. Tell the stories of, of teaching and preaching and healing by the apostles. In chapter 9, we read about Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Where not only his faith is changed, but his name is changed to Paul. At the end of chapter 9, Peter goes to Joppa. Where he heals a man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years. And then he's called to the house of a disciple who had already died, whose name was Tabitha. And when he went up into the room where they had laid her, he asked everybody else to leave. And he prayed, Tabitha, get up. And the woman opened up her eyes and sat up. At the news of this story, other people in Joppa came to believe in the Lord. And that's where we find Peter in our reading this morning. He's among the people of Joppa who have and are coming to the faith. At that time, Cornelius was in Caesarea, uh, about 30 miles away in a coastal city that served as the Roman capital of Palestine. The Jews hated Caesarea. They called it the daughter of Edom and would often speak of it as though it was not even a part of Judea. This was essentially a foreign territory, and Cornelius was essentially a foreigner. Except. Except that he was a devout man who feared God with all of his household. And he gave alms generously to the people, and he prayed constantly to God. Such a description suggests that Cornelius and his household were essentially Jewish even though they were Roman, because they lived the faithful life. Now this created a problem because they were not Jewish by ethnicity, nor through circumcision, so they would never be treated as such. To a devout Jew, Cornelius and his household were Gentiles, but apparently they were not, according to God. During one of the traditional Jewish times of prayer, Cornelius receives a vision. An angel calls him by name, explains that his prayers and his alms have ascended as a memorial before God. 
as though they were incense wafting up into the heavens. And the angel gave Cornelius very clear instructions about what he was to do, which Cornelius very devoutly and obediently responded to. He sent one of his soldiers, who was also a follower of God, and two slaves to find this man, Simon, who was called Peter, who was staying in Joppa, with another man named Simon, just to confuse things. Well, about noon on the next day, Peter, that Simon called Peter, went up onto his roof to pray on the house that was owned by Simon, the other Simon. And he, too, had a vision. But his was nothing like Cornelius's. Peter's vision might have felt more like a midday nightmare because it so affronted his understanding of what was right and what was wrong. Peter was a devout Jew, so he knew the cleanliness codes and he had lived by them faithfully. So seeing a vision of a blanket full of livestock including reptiles and birds, and being told to kill it and eat it would have been difficult for him to hear and impossible for him to do. As a vegetarian, I can't even imagine. (laughs) And Peter responded the way that he responded when Jesus told him that the disciples must deliver him into the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and that he would be killed and on the third day raised from the dead. When Jesus said that, Peter said, Get behind me, Satan. This time he says, by no means. This is the same Peter to whom Jesus said, you are the rock, the chief cornerstone upon whom I will build my church. The same Peter who denied Jesus three times after his arrest and before his crucifixion to only be asked three times by the resurrected Jesus, do you love me? This same Peter is told two other times that he must kill and eat and what is on this blanket that has been lowered before him. For what God has made clean, you must not call profane. Even after three times, this doesn't make sense to Peter. And he was still confused by this vision when Cornelius' men arrive at Simon's house. Now what we don't read is that Peter agreed to go with these men to Cornelius' home. And when he arrived there, Cornelius had gathered many of his relatives and his close friends to greet Peter. And when Cornelius saw Peter, he dropped to his feet. He dropped on his knees at Peter's feet, and Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up, for I am merely a mortal. Now Peter had apparently used his long walk to think about what he was going to say when he got to, to Cornelius' house, or perhaps the Spirit gave him the words. Because he greeted them by saying, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now, may I ask why it is that you sent for me? Well, Cornelius explains that he sent for him in response to his vision, saying that all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say to us. A captive audience, so to speak. So Peter began to to preach, just like he did at Pentecost. And he explained that God shows no partiality, how in every nation anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. Peter preached about Jesus' ministry and crucifixion and resurrection, and how he had commanded them to preach and testify that Jesus is the one ordained by God as the judge of the living and the dead, and that all who believed in him would receive the forgiveness of their sins. While Peter was preaching, The Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. And the Jewish believers who had come with Peter were astounded. They were astounded that the Holy Spirit had been poured upon these Gentiles. It was a little Pentecost right there in Cornelius' house. The chapter concludes with Peter asking the question, can anyone withhold water, the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And then Peter ordered 
that they were to be baptized. I don't know if we can fully appreciate the significance of this scene. Peter was called to the home of a man who, according to the Jewish law, was unclean. And by his association, Peter could be made unclean as well. Cornelius and his household were as unsavory to Peter as a blanket of meat is to a vegetarian like me. Oh, please, Lord, don't call me into that. (laughs) But yet God spoke, and all of that changed. What once had been unclean and unsuitable for human consumption was now clean and declared good for eating. And those who were undesirable were now desirable because God had declared them as such. Last Sunday, Pastor Bruce, Bruce preached. He, he didn't preach. He, Pastor Bruce preached from the last five verses of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus told the disciples to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. In this morning's reading from Acts, Peter was sent to what was essentially another nation, even though it was only 30 miles away. And Peter went into a Gentile home even though all of his religious training, his education, and his experience said that he shouldn't. But he did. He did so because he was sent as we too have been sent. Sent with the good news of God's redeeming love for all people. For Jews and Gentiles, male and female, slave and free. During the season of Easter, we get to explore the implications of the resurrection together. And the implications are vast, immense, life-giving, impossible to fully understand or comprehend. The resurrection is good news. It's good news to a family who's grieving the death of a father a grandfather, a husband. It's good news to a household of people who have been deemed other by society, unclean through that long-held traditions of the church. It's good news to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our families, to our friends, and even to our enemies those who don't think like we do, those who don't look like we do, those who don't behave as we do. It is good news. Peter was sent into the most unlikely of places, but what is clear is that he was not sent alone. For as Jesus promised the disciples that he would be with them to the end of the age, at the end of last week's reading from Matthew's Gospel, In Acts, we see God's presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit not only went with Peter to Cornelius' house, it clearly preceded him there. For Cornelius was prepared to receive Peter. Not only to receive him, but to go and get him and, and have him brought back to his house. And the Spirit was present with Cornelius' household, his family, and close friends, so that while Peter was preaching... The Spirit descended upon them so that there was proof of his presence there among them. Not described as a Pentecost event, but no less impactful so that they could hear the word of God and respond. Hear it in a way that made sense to them and respond and become baptized. So to make a long story short, the Spirit like the wind, goes where it will. And we, like the disciples, are sent into the world to join the work that that Spirit has already begun in all nations, among all people. Because God shows no partiality, and we shall not call anything or anyone unclean whom God has declared clean, righteous, and acceptable. 
Hallelujah. Amen.